China's great imperial city is located in the center of its ancient Middle Kingdom, a gigantic and inscrutable empire beyond the Great Wall. The imperial city is entered through the gates of heavenly peace. On the 25th of December 1911, the mother of the young emperor Puyi announced his abdication. Thus, the empires ceased to exist. The most impressive building works in China began over 500 years ago. After seven years in construction, the Ming Emperor Zhu Di moved into his newly established palace complex. Under the strictest ceremonial rituals, over 8,000 people lived here in almost a thousand rooms. Furthermore, the palace was to serve as residential and governmental seat to the emperors of the Ming and Qing dynasties. At the rear palace wall, groups of elderly people practice rhythmic exercises, whilst hairdressers cut their customers' hair. And on the morning market is all that the surrounding countryside of Beijing has to offer. In the drum tower, the roll of drums marks the change of the night shift. And in the tower, bells ring in the beginning of a new day. The garden of the old summer palace was once the most beautiful and lavish in China. Right up to it being destroyed by the French and English armies, it was under continuous development. For half the year, the garden served as the summer residence for the emperors of the Qing dynasty. A stone's throw away from the old summer palace is the Garden of Harmonious Unity, otherwise known as the Summer Palace. For his mother's 60th birthday, the Yihe Yuan was an audacious gift from her son, the Qianlong Emperor. Its splendid grounds extended over 716 acres, and soon it was the favorite garden of the Emperor's household, who retreated to its cool lakeside shores during the humid summer months. In 1860, the Summer Palace was destroyed. Money that was destined to go to restoring the naval fleet was diverted and went instead toward financing the restoration of the Summer Palace. Also, a second wave of destruction struck the palace. But yet again, the empress, the widow Sixi, was able to raise funds for its restoration. She spent most of her evenings at the summer palace. The view is even more enhanced by the calm evening atmosphere. Twenty-five kilometers from Beijing, the mountains to the west act as a natural city defense. The highest point of the mountain range is Perfumed Mountain. The sprawling countryside has many entertaining facilities. From the summit, there is a fantastic view of the western mountains and on a fine day, a clear view of Beijing. Bordering the park is the Temple of Azure Blue Clouds that became famous thanks to its marble Vajra Stupa. Here, 
both the past and the present are closely linked. The mysterious Middle Kingdom has changed a lot during recent years, but its fascinating contrasts remain to the present day. Emperor Guangzhou founded the Garden of 10,000 Animals. Every year, 10 million visitors come to see the pandas. In the 10th century, the Beihai Park served as summer residence for the emperors of the Liao dynasty with Lake Island and the Moon Palace. Also, the round city was part of the emperor's garden area. There is an impressive feeling of peace and contemplation in the park of the Sun Altar. In the center of the park is the Sun Altar for the worship of natural strength. And Kublai Khan had built the 60 meter high white Temple of the White Pagoda. Today's Beijing is also a modern city. With neon lights, huge shopping malls and high quality products from all over the world. In the city's numerous night markets, there's a vast selection of food products and an incredible assortment of souvenirs. The Liwan Theatre offers colourful and lively excerpts from the famous Beijing Opera. In a one-hour show, the rich traditions of Chinese folklore are presented. At the main station, around 200,000 people meet daily. The hustle and bustle is indescribable. The new Beijing boasts modern skyscrapers and shopping centers, as well as international hotels and the indispensable temples of fast food. In Beijing, the Palace of Harmony and Peace is the largest and marvelous Tibetan Buddhist temple for future, present and past. The Confucius Temple was built in keeping with the old buildings on the right of the Emperor's Academy. Each time the Emperor visited the Academy, he went to the Confucius Temple to demonstrate his devotion. The Faiyuan Temple, Temple of the Source of Law, is one of the oldest in the city. In the center of the Muslim quarter is the New Jie Mosque, the largest and oldest mosque in Beijing. The Temple of the White Cloud was of great importance during the Yuan era, as Kublai Khan promoted a Daoistic priest called Kui Chu Ji from the province of Shandong to the position of national teacher. As such, he was head of all Taoist sects. Later, 
the temple became the centre of the northern sect, whose members led a life of celibacy and strict vegetarianism. The heavenly temple represents the largest temple grounds in China. It should have been named Heavenly Altar, as prayers are offered to heaven and earth at the same time. The temple complex was built even in 1420. A portrait of the Chinese cosmic illusions. Close to Badaling, the Great Wall of China extends majestically across misty mountains. It is the largest man-made structure in the world. The wall was erected in order to protect the country from invasion from the north. The gigantic wall presented the division of two very different cultures. On one side, the Central Asian nomads, and on the other, the highly developed civilization of the emerging Chinese Empire. The Qing emperors knew exactly where to shelter during Beijing's hot summer months. In the Valley of Coolness. At that time, a beautiful forested river valley, 250 kilometers northeast of Beijing. In former Rehe, today's Chengde, is the old summer residence of the Manchu dynasty that took more than a century to construct. Garden covers 560 hectares and is the largest imperial park complex in China. The greatness of the Manchu dynasty is also depicted by the highlighting of various important regions via the construction of various temple complexes. This was built in gratitude to China's loyal protectorate of Tibet. Because of its similarity, to its counterpart in Lhasa. The winter residence of the Dalai Lama, the Chengde Temple is often referred to as Little Portala, a clear understatement considering its generous dimensions. The Temple Monastery of Xumi Fushu Miao is one of the most impressive buildings in the city. Translated, the temple's name is Happiness and Longevity of the Summer Hill, Xumi Fushu Miao. The temple was built in 1780 to mark the visit to China of a senior Tibetan religious dignitary, the sixth Panchen Lama. It is a replica of what was his own monastery in Tibet. The construction of this monastery played an important role in the diplomatic relationship between the Chinese Emperor Qing Long and Tibet. Many of the Tibetan cultural figures and symbols included in the stunning architecture refer to the origins of their design. Puning Si is another of the eight magnificent monastery and temple complexes in the northern section of the Imperial Summer Residence. Its front section remained true to traditional Chinese Han design because it commemorated an important military event.
This section emphasized China's domination of the feared Yungas, who were of Mongolian origin. Surprisingly, the impressive 37-meter-high Mahayana pavilion is constructed of wood. The intention of the emperor's architects to create a harmonious relationship between both nature and architecture is plain to see. Pule Si, the temple of universal joy, is located in the middle of the eastern section of the sanctuary. It is similar to an older building in Beijing. The eight outer temples symbolized various Chinese ethnic groups. Those who were loyal to the emperor were duly honored within this temple area. In the 18th century, China had become the greatest and most prosperous empire in the world. The magnificent summer residence of the Qing Emperor and its surrounding buildings are a glorious and remarkable demonstration of ultimate power. Shanghai, a gigantic city a meeting point of both East and West. The shoreline is without a doubt the city's main focal point. It is a combination of the past, present and future. It contains the historic monuments and eye-catching buildings of a great city. Shanghai was once referred to as the Whore of Asia, capital of crime, the Paris of the East and the center of Maoism. But this is a place of history. Today the gigantic metropolis is ruled by modern thinking communists and the Yangtze Delta is not only China's largest port but also its new shining star of capitalism. In the 18th century the West showed considerable interest in Shanghai as an important trading center. But China was uncooperative. However, following the Opium Wars, in 1842 the British moved in and forced a concession from the Chinese. Five years later the French followed. Foreign capital was introduced, factories were built and many people moved into the city in search of work. The shipbuilding industry immediately took off and almost overnight Shanghai became the most modern city in Asia and also a paragon of Western decadence. The Oriental Pearl Tower is a mighty 468 meter high television tower that since 1995 has extended high above the city skyline. The view is overwhelming. A wide river calmly winds its way through this lively city that in recent times has experienced a complete transformation. The most recently built city quarter of Pudong is often referred to as Boomtown. This is a new but as yet undefined world, a city of the future, None of the old town has survived, and the word Chinatown is now politically incorrect. With its entrance on the Lishui Lu, this district is called Southern Market. In the center of the city's labyrinth-like shopping alleys, a zigzag bridge extends across a small pond to a famous tea house. The bridge was designed thus in order to fend off evil spirits, who it is believed can walk only in a straight line. Directly opposite is the entrance to Yu Yuan. This garden is the pride of the city because it is one of the few remaining cultural monuments in Shanghai.
Nanjing Lu is the new center of Shanghai. China's sparkling showcase that contains both old and modern shopping centers. A commercial heart of the city. A few years ago, the People's Square contained wide streets and a race course. Today it's a green area with fountains and white doves. This was once the center of this huge city. And for wedding couples, a photo opportunity in front of this large fountain is an absolute must. Each evening, several of the city's theaters feature an acrobatic show, a particularly popular attraction in China. There's so much to see and do that time soon slips by. The dexterity of the acrobats is truly mesmerizing. Shanghai is the vivacious pulse of China. But the gigantic city of today is only the beginning. The city of the future awaits. Suzhou. Famous explorer Marco Polo referred to this extraordinary city as the Venice of the East. The city is particularly famous for its gardens. Some extremely elegant buildings are remnants of a glorious past. The city was founded in 514 BC when the Chinese monarch He Lu Von Wu made it his capital. Above a broad 24 kilometer long wall is a path with many interesting sights along the way and a picturesque view across the city's watery streets. But Suzhou is above all famous for its gardens. The garden of the policy of the common people is one of China's four most famous gardens. The complex was built between 1522 and 1566 at the command of an important Mandarin and designed according to his wishes. Covering a much smaller area is the Garden of the Master of the Nets that despite its smaller dimensions is considered to be a gem of garden architecture. The origin of the garden dates back to the 12th century. The beautiful Suzhou complexes seem to emulate an even more famous garden, the Garden of Eden. South of Suzhou is Zhuzhuan that is said to have been the first water village in China. A journey on its canals is certainly worthwhile. Little has changed here since bygone times. This is ancient China today. Natural village life and picturesque scenery. The journey by rowing boat on the fascinating canals is a good way to see the sights, but sometimes even the waterways become quite busy. It's surprising that this wonderful medieval village has only relatively recently been discovered by tourism. Quan Fu Temple is located on the outermost edge of the village, protected by a wall and a dam toward an open lake.
This large temple complex with its natural water garden was built during the Song dynasty and is dedicated to Buddha. Venice of the Far East. This is the name of the ancient Chinese city of Lijiang in the northwest of Yunnan province. The picturesque center of the old town of Dayan is an architectural gem. Dayan's houses are of traditional stone, wood and roof tile construction. Lijiang is also the center of the Naxi, a Tibetan tribe that has a long and impressive culture. At one time, the Naxi were a nomadic tribe, but several centuries ago, they discarded their wandering lifestyle and replaced their tents for wooden huts in the Lijiang Valley. At the foot of Lion Hill in the southern part of the city, is the exquisite entrance area to the Mu residence. When evening comes, this residence is an attractive setting for the reenactment of age-old rituals. The Mu residence also features traditional music and dance performances carried out with all the authenticity of bygone times. Close to Lijiang is the Jade Temple of Jufen Si and a group of musicians and dancers. The Naxi tribe is very religious and the gods influence their everyday lives. They frequently visit the temples that they consider to be sacred. Buishan is a typical village of this region. Just as it was hundreds of years ago, the farmers slowly lead their ox wagons through the village. The narrow alleys are built of stone. The houses are immaculate and it is normal for the local people to wear traditional costume. Because of China's high regard for its ethnic minorities, this ancient tribe has been able to maintain its age-old traditions to the present day. Back again in Lijiang, we visit the beautiful Heilong Tun Park in the north of the old town. In the center of Dragon Lake is the Moon Pavilion that is accessible by way of a bridge. It is said that this was the place in which two desperate Naxi lovers burnt themselves alive. Following a three hour drive northwest through enchanting avenues and remote mountain areas, we arrive at a natural spectacle that is quite breathtaking. Wo Tiao Sha, Tiger Jump Canyon. Access is by way of a precarious road built into the rock walls, and deep down nothing but a raging green water.
The Yangtze has cut deep into the rock of the Jade Dragon Mountains and created a canyon that is unique in the world. The less energetic can travel the steep and narrow steps in the relative comfort of a sedan chair. The Yangtze is the country's longest river and ends in Shanghai where it enters the China Sea. The tempestuous water flows with relentless power through the 30 meter wide canyon that is blocked by a huge rock. The canyon derived its name when a tiger making its escape from the royal hunt saved itself by jumping across the canyon. Kunming is the metropolis of the Chinese province of Yunnan in the southwest of this enormous country. The city of everlasting spring in which a mild climate and the great outdoors are part of everyday life. Both its climate and unique location made this city the ideal choice for the International Expo held on the northern edge of the city in 1999. The Buddhist temple of Ikan Ton Si dates back to the Tang Dynasty. The design of the city's largest temple complex was influenced by many diverse ethnic groups. A fascinating part of the city's cultural life are the evening dance performances provided by numerous folk groups. They offer a good insight into a variety of Chinese cultures. The road to the Western Mountains lets us pass by farmhouses in which local farmers cook geese in traditional stone ovens and past skillful stonemasons whose skillful hands create the famous stone lions. By cable railway we go slowly up to the hill. On reaching the summit, we walk through the Dragon Gate of Luan Yan, from where the long and arduous descent down the steep steps of Buddha Hill can begin. On the downward journey, the temples loom larger and larger. Extending along the foot of the western mountain is the floral temple of Hua Ting. It contains a small pond surrounded by bamboo and pine trees. But Yunnan's most famous site is situated 126 kilometers east, the unique stone forest of Shi Lin, a forest of rock that extends for 27,000 hectares. Its limestone rock originated from a long since dried up ocean. The elements finally created these bizarre formations. The peaks of the stone forest are up to 30 meters high, but the exhausting climb is rewarded by outstanding views. Small pools reflect the intriguing stone needles and huge rocks that were created during millions of years of natural erosion. The most amazing formations were given dramatic names. The Sea of Fire, Dragon's Tooth and Heavenly Sword. Pagodas, columns and strange flowers appear to rise from the rock. 
Of course, magic and romance are usually included in legend. It is said that one of the immortal Taoist priests presented this desolate area to two lovers. Guilin, or flower-scented wood, has served to epitomize China's beautiful landscape for the past thousand years. The morning hustle and bustle along the Lijiang River has also begun. The boats are approached by tiny stone bridges and numerous steps. Here, one of the world's most beautiful river trips embarks. A journey on the famous Lijiang River. The pleasure boats cruise at a leisurely pace on the Green River towards our destination, Yangshu. Like a green silk ribbon, for 83 kilometers the river winds through lush countryside. Barren and unusual cone-shaped mountains suddenly appear from the plains. These bizarre wonders of nature are unique to our planet. It took 200 million years for these desolate and mysterious mountains to break through the Earth's crust. The ocean reached the low-lying regions in which shell chalk was deposited. When the Earth's surface erupted, limestone formations were created. Regular downpours of rain hollowed out the soft limestone and sculpted the mountains. The landscape is so beautiful that it's like being in a land of eternity. A description of the splendor of this place by a famous Chinese author from the Ming Dynasty. Slowly the convoy of pleasure boats reaches the end of its journey. The provincial town of Yangshu. These fishermen, in their traditional garments and pointed straw hats, have for centuries fished in this age-old way with cormorants. People are influenced by their environment, and this is most certainly so in southern China. In spite of arduous rural life and hard physical labor, the people are happy and contented. In the center of this bizarre landscape, in which for many generations myth and legend have been an integral part of everyday life, tradition and community have retained their value, qualities which have long since disappeared from the hectic world outside. An amazing world where everything is just fine. Hong Kong, gateway to China, the window of the world, a mega city with more than 8 million inhabitants and rising a city of the superlative, glimmering skyscrapers that seem to take root in the sky. One elegant building after another, with shining glass and high-tech facades. Around 150 years ago, Hong Kong Island was under British colonial rule, and today only a few buildings of this period remain, such as St. John's Cathedral. Hong Kong tramway that travels parallel with the northern coastline also dates back to colonial times. It's ideal for sightseeing. From the peak, the view is truly breathtaking. The city's gigantic skyscrapers seem like toys and there's a comprehensive view of the huge harbour. Most of the sightseeing tours 
around the harbour, embark from Central Station close to the ferry terminal. The journey travels past Kowloon and several huge cruise ships that lie at anchor. Suddenly, the Tsing Ma Bridge appears, the world's longest chain link bridge. The glass facades of Hong Kong Island's skyline shine out in the light of the afternoon. The Man Mo Temple dates back to the Hong Kong of bygone times. There are around 600 temples in this town. Although not as large as it used to be, the city of junks known as Aberdeen has provided the backdrop for many a motion picture. Much of it has been filled in and thus little of it remains. Just a narrow canal. Ocean Peak was built on a nearby promontory. A huge entertainment park with replicas of dinosaurs and real pandas and a butterfly house. Next, there's a journey by cable car along the hill to the furthest end. Repulse Bay is a bathing beach on the southern coast of the island. The tutelary gods of fishermen and seafarers protect also swimmers and surfers. Kowloon is a peninsula on the southern coast of China. Both night and day, cruise ships and ferry boats are moored alongside Kowloon Pier, opposite the city's world-famous skyline. Within the Wong Tai Sin Temple, the city's largest temple, each day, thousands of the faithful seek good fortune in romance and betting, with prayers and sacrifices. Among the modern skyscrapers is a new park, Kowloon Park. An oasis of tranquility amid the indescribable clamour of the traffic and people of Tsim Sha Tsui. The Chi Lin Nunnery is the city's most recent religious building. It was completely restored and was inaugurated in 2002. North of the Kowloon Peninsula is one of Hong Kong's less familiar areas, the New Territories. Lo Wai Village is one of the region's last fortified villages. For several centuries, those living here settled around the city's first harbour. They consisted of clans and lived in separate villages. In 1736, the Tin Hao Temple was built near to the village of Tai Po. High on a small hill is the impressive Chuk Lam Shim Yuan Monastery. The ferry boat trip goes to Lantau Island. Our destination is Tai O. A small village whose inhabitants still earn their living from fishing and where every other shop offers dried fish and shrimp paste. The people here are believed to be the ancestors of the Yue, the first prehistoric settlers of this region. A more beautiful location for a Buddhist monastery is hard to imagine. High up in the mountains is the Po Lin Monastery. Remote, peaceful, and with an extensive view across the island and the sea. This, the largest Buddha statue in the world, 
is 26 meters high and weighs 200 tons. But the ferry returns its passengers in short time back to the world of contrasts. In Hong Kong, everything seems to run at a faster pace. Here is pulsating life during day and night, even with all of its constant noise. Within this city of dreams and Asiatic flair, there are eight million people. Hong Kong, the fine smelling harbor, is one of the most exciting cities in the world. After 466 years, Portugal handed back the city of Macau to China. On the peninsula, the ruins of Sao Paulo are well worth a closer look. This was once the bastion of Christianity in Asia. Its many old cannon and mighty fortress walls are reminders of those times when invasion was a constant threat. Macau is small and museum-like, a colonial gem in Asia. When Macau became a Portuguese colony, along with the first settlers came priests to bring Christianity throughout China. The old center of the city is the Largo do Senado. On the southwestern side of the square is the noble-looking Leal Senado. The former residence of the influential city senate is now City Hall. Macau's largest Buddhist temple, Kun Yam Tong, dates back 400 years to the Ming Dynasty, when its original foundations were built. Beyond its main gate, just off a busy street in the north of the city, is a peaceful oasis of silence and contemplation. The Jardim Lu Lim Yok Park looks like a tropical fairy tale scene. In the heart of the city, the Cemiterio do São Miguel is Macau's largest Catholic cemetery. Macau's oldest park, Jardim Luis de Camoes, belonged to the British East India Company. Close by, a tall gate leads to an elegant building that dates back to colonial times. At the entrance to the inner part of the harbour, and dating back to the 15th century, is the city's oldest place of worship for its Chinese inhabitants, Ama Miu. It was built into a mountainside. Ama, the Taoistic goddess of seafarers and fishermen, is worshipped here. This temple complex existed long before the arrival of the Portuguese. Opposite the temple, by the water's edge, is the modern Museo Maritimo. Journey by Junk is a fascinating and nostalgic experience. Along the coast, beneath a long bridge, which leads on big stilts towards Taipa. Taipa is the largest of the two islands that belong to Macau. Tangled and narrow alleys in the centre of Vila Taipa abound with rural character. The islanders are highly religious and like to take great pride. During Macau's golden years, the remote bays on the outer island of Koloane were the haunt of pirates.
One of the Vila Coloane's few highlights is a tiny Portuguese square. For many years, Macau's casinos were its principal source of revenue and created the wealth that financed the island. Since the middle of the 19th century, and lying only 60 kilometers away, the former British colony of Hong Kong was this region's glittering center of capitalism, while Macau was a place of melancholy and nostalgia. However, today, both belong to China.